Hare Krishna, Shana Kushi Prabhu. Welcome Hare to the Monks Podcast. Thank you. Yeah. I have started this from about one and a half years ago. And so many devotees, right from Anuttama Prabhu, Garuda Prabhu, and others, they suggested that I invite you for the podcast. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, when I had come to London and Oxford, we had very thought-provoking discussion about OCHS and what all you have been doing over there. So... Generally, when we have this podcast, we try to discuss topics which are relevant for devotees and upcoming devotees, but topics which may not be discussed in our mainstream uh, classes. Yeah. So one topic I thought of today was something like uh, insider and outsider perceptions of Krishna consciousness, Mm -hmm. of religion in general and Krishna consciousness in particular. Sometimes the devotee view is that Sometimes there is a, like a radical division where devotees, insiders try to see outsiders as evil or demoniac or, or very negative view. And outsiders see insiders as sentimental or brainwashed or cult members. So there are these insider and outsider perceptions. So how we can uh, reconcile them? Maybe we could discuss broadly on that topic today, if that's okay with you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So I remember during our meeting, uh, when we had it in, uh, o- in OCHS, that you had mentioned about how there was this pro- professor you had hosted. And um, he had come to the temple and he said that, uh, that something like being in the temple was a very challenging experience for him because he had been trained as a Christian, uh, this is Christian's, professor Christian scholar. He said he had been trained to see Indians or Hindus or other religion people as, as not being connected with God at all. But he said he couldn't avoid the, he couldn't deny the devotion that was there in the devotees in the morning program. Mm-hmm. So, so that is, you could say an outsider changing their perception. So maybe you, can you tell about why you felt it was important for us to consider outsider perceptions and how that shaped your service of, say, making a pioneering of OCHS and other things? Well, we, we, can't, we, we can't live in this world without bumping into each other. Um, so we all live on this planet together, and it's Krishna's planet, and we're all Krishna's servants, whether we admit to it or not. Um, and even within our temples, within our communities, within our families, um, everyone is an individual. That's, that's the spiritual conclusion that's the essence of of Vaishnava Vedanta so um, Krishna says to Arjuna never was there a time when I did not exist nor you nor all these kings here on this Mm -hmm. battlefield we all exist eternally as individuals so that's that's a, a very important assumption philosophical assumption as to how we see the world so everyone we see is an individual. They're all, they're all making their own way to Krishna or to truth, to their idea of truth. And so in a temple, we're, we're going to see Krishna on the altar. And our truth is Krishna. But I'm standing beside someone who's seeing a different Krishna, whose experience of Krishna is different. So everyone I see in a temple is different, and, they, and their perspective is different. And then I go to another temple, and they have a different guru and a, and a different deity. It's not Sri Sri Radha Madhava, Sri Sri Madangopal. Who's Madangopal? Radha Madhava is God. <laughs> so, okay. but, and we haven't even gone into Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or, or atheism, or anything. Even just among ourselves, this is an issue. So insider or outsider, what does it mean? It's, it's, okay. a, it's a kind of a bogus de- designation in one sense. That really? if, you look, a- if you look at it from a... Uh, a okay. philosophical perspective. It doesn't make sense. I, I understand when it makes sense, why it makes sense, but but ultimately, no matter how we rationalize it, it really doesn't make sense. Okay. That's a very striking perspective. Uh, now, I agree with our philosophical foundational understanding that we are all individuals. Uh, but at the same time, generally the way Krishna consciousness is taught uh, it, there is understood that there has to be some kind of conformity that you know, we stop speculating 
and align ourselves with authentic author, author, authentic or authoritative understanding that is given in scriptures so mm-hmm. to what extent does the need for conformity that naturally comes with belonging to any tradition uh harmonize with or relate with the natural individuality that is innate to every person so when we take this conceptual idea of individuality and mm. and and bring this heavenly idea down to the earthly plane then we hear like bhaktivinoda you know, thakur says we should associate with like minded devotees so it's not you can't just associate with anyone and everyone everyone's got different opinions so common sense dictates that we associate it with with like minded people and that will enthuse us and inspire us to go on our path so we all club together and we we raise a little flag and we fly our flag and we're a little group of stamp collectors or devotees of krishna or whatever it is uh, army officers we've all got our little clubs and we have to understand that's how uh, human psychology works and human emotional need works and also spirituality it's the same principles we need to club together because none of us exist as an individual we just are individuals but to exist to flourish we need the association of others we need that emotional support and ultimately um what we're looking for all our acharyas say is love now all bollywood films say the same thing and all the fiction says the same thing and all the music we hear says the same thing so all the, all the everyone is reaching out looking for love a very ill defined term but okay. our acharyas are defining it they're defining it in terms of individuality and the collective and interestingly this concept of spiritual individuality when we talk about dharma we always talk about others dharma is never about ourselves so how do we act in the world how does a spiritual individual act in the world out of concern for everybody else so how to take care of others how to sacrifice the concept of ahimsa the concept of seva this is all about others so okay. one one through the world if uh, i mean you're making a lot of important points which i would yeah. like to recon- uh, just to clarify i like what you said is that we don't simply see we are individuals but overall our existence and functioning is largely through interaction with others yeah and that that's definitely true and love and compassion are there but at the same time the general understanding is that if we are belonging to a tradition we have the right knowledge and others are off from that knowledge to varying degrees yes so uh, showing, i mean, i i yeah yeah I, i was born into the catholic church in ireland okay and and they had the right knowledge and then i joined this con at the age of 18 and they had the right knowledge <laughs> okay so who who has the right knowledge so on the the belt buckles of the german soldiers in world war 1 it said gut mit uns god with us yeah so he what he wasn't with the french he wasn't with the english so we can all lay claim on we have the right knowledge how much of it do we have how many of us have read the vedas the upanishads the itihasas the brahmanas the all the puranas all 18 of them but who has knowledge we may have access we may have been given shown the door have we actually entered the door have we actually gone on the path of knowledge uh, have we turned our knowledge into wisdom into realized knowledge the, these are other questions that need to be answered too so yes, i can yeah. I, i i agree I, with this point i'm sorry to interrupt you yes we all have a long way to go toward realizing that knowledge but the general understanding is that to realize that knowledge it is we who have to practice our own sadhana and go deeper into our tradition why does it require openness to other tradition exploring other traditions or say exploring uh, because other traditions have understanding that may vary from different degrees and nowadays we could say many people we don't belong to any tradition they just they have the post modern world where uh, but people have different understandings so transform knowledge into realization it is the krishna conscious process itself that is enough but when we start talking about outsider perspectives then they in fact they challenge our un- traditional understanding of krishna consciousness so for example one outsider perspective could be that 
in the vedas bhagavad gita was spoken 5000 years ago or about 2000 years ago the dating of scriptures could be there the origin mm-hmm. of scriptures could be there even the status of the divinity of krishna or the divinity of lord chaitanya so we i don't want to go into specific issues over here my point is that uh, in general i don't see how outsider perspectives understanding out, outsider perspectives will actually transform knowledge into realization it is actually going it, deeper it, into again, the pers- perspective again i would yeah again i would go back to the definition of insider outsider um in some even in some iskon contexts okay. i'm a white man i'm a catholic okay. i'm irish i'm not i'm not born into this tradition okay even though even though i've practiced it for over 40 years but for some for some people um and and i I've, i've been in south india where i gave a lecture and after the lecture a uh, a brahmin stood up and declared how disqualified i was <laughs> to give the lecture because oh, i wasn't okay. i wasn't okay. born to talk about the scriptures to quote the scriptures etc so so how do we define these things and f- okay. for me personally um i have two basic principles in life krishna's god and prabhupada's the boss and for me okay. everything else is negotiable and okay. if i if i meet a um a rabbi if i meet a a christian minister if i meet a a, a mullah uh i'm perfectly happy to talk to them about their idea of god their idea of suffering the 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 issues that we can all talk about fairly easily their idea of compassion and tolerance and love i don't have any difficulty talking about these things with anyone because this is in the 10th canto of the gita krishna talks about vada being of all the processes of discourse he is vada and vada means that you get people from different perspectives to come and talk about the truth sat what is truth what is real and some people will be scientific they they're not interested in god they're just interested in seeing reality in the material context and some people are interested in in the spiritual context and some people are more religious uh, sectarian everyone's got their perspective but we need to be open to hearing we need to have that uh, that uh, open heartedness but as we go through life we make our decisions and mm-hmm. for me as i say just personally after meeting all these people which i've gone out of my way to do um my principles are krishna is god and prabhupada is the boss that's and beautiful. that's okay. that's where my focus is and based on that i can talk to anyone and i'm not afraid i'm not threatened because i've made my decision my acharya is founder acharya as we call him is feel probable and so everyone measures up to that and if if someone s- says um like in one lecture i gave in belfast in north ireland someone stood up at the back and said your krishna is not god he's just he's just a goat herd he didn't even get the cow herd oh, thing oh god okay yeah and uh and you know that's a a certain perspective now i could have said yeah and jesus christ is an unemployed carpenter you know oh, uh, but what okay. it, it's kind of you've you've brought these persons down to a very material mundane economic level mm-hmm. and that's that's not their worth so if that's if that's the only value you see in god and krishna then yeah that person at the moment is not going to be my sangha i got it because to me krishna is god therefore i want to talk to people who have that understanding and then and that's my club and they're the people i i worship my deities i want to talk to people about my the experiences i have when i worship my deities i can't talk about that to everybody it's a personal thing it's an experience it's not about um rational thought it's not about intellectual pursuit it's not about religion it's a personal experience i have of god and it's personal to me and it's not personal even to other devotees they'll come and see my de- de- i remember we were in spain at a conference one time and the devotees from all over my friends and i had someone had given me a little giriraj and for years i'd i'd always in my heart very silently wondered if maybe if you ever want to come to me i'm here you know and and giriraj came i was so thrilled and i brought my friends into the room and said look <laughs> so giriraj and he was so special to me and i was so overwhelmed by him and uh, they all looked and it was just another giriraj to them <laughs> and i realized this is my experience of god 
and we all we all have our individual experience of God. So I'm an insider in my relationship with my little Giriraj Govinda, as I call him. Uh, but I'm the only one. <laughs> I'm the only one who has oh that God. relationship. And, so and now so, I sorry, now I understand what you're saying about the individual uh, individual outsider in the insider outsider discussion being so problematic. Yeah. And ultimately, if you want to say the insider, you could reduce the insider to only an individual. Yes. And each of us could become almost like an island. Where, yes. but, and then what you said earlier that we can't exist as islands like that. We are relational creatures. Yes. So uh, Now, an, another point, uh, sorry, uh, just to interrupt you, Yeah. It's just, just to, the reason why that Krishna's God, why Prabhupada is the boss for me, when Prabhupada gave his uh, uh, nectar devotion lectures in 1973 in Vrindavan, this is a series of lectures he gave on this text, and it, it's become, become quite famous. But one thing that caught me, I was a very young devotee, and I was listening to these lectures, and he said, Suridam Sarvabhutanam, Krishna is your only friend. And he said, you may say that I am your friend, but he said, I may not be there at the time of death for you, but Krishna will be there. Krishna is your only friend. And I was so impressed because I'd heard of all kinds of gurus and swamis and yogis, but here was someone who was most definitely saying, don't worship me, worship Krishna. And there was such integrity in that. The, the integrity of his message was right there. He had disciples who he was conscious. He said, you may say that I am your friend. He was conscious of what they thought of him and how they elevated him, but he told them the truth. I was so impressed with that integrity. And that's why he's, he's the boss for me. And that's the integrity, the character that I'm looking for in people. And that's not, that's not purely spiritual. That issue of character is an issue of dharma, of principle, that we, we decide to follow certain principles and one of our principles, of course, is Krishna is God and Prabhupada is the boss. They're, they're my principles. And, and then we have ahimsa, we have seva. There are certain things that we add to our life. And by adding them to our life, our life becomes consciously constrained. So they, Prabhupada says the sadhu is someone who is strict with himself, but liberal with everybody else, which means our spiritual sadhana is very individual. It, we, we adopt our principles. They're our principles. They're not everybody else's, and we know that. We've adopted them through association with sadhus, through association with devotees, through association with Krishna, through, our, through practices, and then we adopt these principles, and someone else doesn't adopt these principles. And I remember we have our four regulative principles in ISKCON. I'm not talking about those principles. I remember one devotee saying, I, I only practice three, and I said, oh, goodness. Well, uh, and I was guessing which one was the one he wasn't practicing. And he said, yes, I practiced the three, no meat, fish, and eggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So we all have our, own, we all have our principles. And they're, they have to be individual to us because they define us. They define our integrity. There is so much that is uh, stimulating thought in this and discussion in what you have said. So let's backtrack a little bit. And uh, you see, the, the kind of understanding that you are giving of Krishna consciousness, at one level, it resonates with, you could say, both intuition and experience. Yeah, we are all individuals. And I, like you mentioned about earlier, about going to different ISKCON temples also. I have traveled, before the pandemic, I was traveling almost nine months a year. And every temple is significantly different in its own way. Although uh, we can say that as Krishna is, Krishna is God and Prabhupada is is, uh, is the boss. That's yeah. true. So now when you said that Prabhupada is the boss, you also said it not in the exclusive sense that sometimes people say Jesus is the only way. That Prabhupada is the boss in the sense that Prabhupada is the person who is taking us to Krishna. And, and that like, I won't be there, but Krishna will be there with you. So in that sense, even the so we can, I often, in my, whenever I have to speak on interfaith, I use the metaphor of mountain. Like we are at the bottom of the mountain and we have to go to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. But there could be many paths up the mountain. But if we want to go up, we have to, we have to take, follow the path which we have taken. So in one sense, Prabhupada is showing us the path up the mountain. But there could be other paths up the mountain also. 
and we can connect with people from other traditions and other perspectives and in one sense going back to your earlier point about we uh, being individuals so it's almost like although there is one path which we are taking we could say one path is the gaudiya vaishnavas we are taking but still within that path also each one of us has our individual journey yes and it's almost like we are we could say we are uh, charting our own path within that broad path yes hmm well, with, without doubt we all have individual relationships with krishna and in the end it's it's us and krishna on our deathbed it's us and krishna nobody else okay and krishna is not not coming to say and and say here i am and you're saying i i did everything i was told to do that, that that's that's not necessarily a personal relationship we're being asked to develop an intimate relationship with krishna that means very personal it it's a personal understanding of krishna a personal dependence on krishna a personal um emotional relationship with krishna and 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 that's that's something we all have to do consciously so so it's not that we just follow these guidelines these rules these regulations and then everything will be okay that's religion and that's very good and that keeps us off the streets but spirituality is more than that our our relationship with krishna is more than that and and all of that is is very important you know because we do live in society we relationship is everything to us in gaudiya vaishnavism it's all about relationships it's all about our relationship with krishna and with our gurus our uh, older devotees our sangha with the world around us our, our relationship with the environment with all the animals etc they're all they're all krishna's servants and and the environment is krishna's parkland so our environmental policy is clear don't mess with that you know uh, sustain it maintain it so our our krishna consciousness should infuse absolutely everything but it's all about relationship so if we if we're focused on our relationship with krishna and not taking care of the poor people in our city the underprivileged in our city and also the overprivileged in our city who are just as poor spiritually beautiful you know then then we don't understand what relationship means but we do it in consciousness of our relationship with krishna so without the thought of krishna my my efforts to help are are quite useless such a drop in the ocean no, no real significance at all but you know all these things <laughs> i know i mean i i do know how do we put it that see there as i said the what you're saying there are certain things you're known but you're not always articulated in that way so just uh, going backward so in one sense what you are saying is that compassion or a spiritual vision of others is not just about say transforming them into devotees it is also about understanding their individuality and connecting with them as individuals yes because then we have the possibility of sharing our krishna consciousness with them bhakti means to share the word means baj it means to share so then our process of mission of preaching of outreach means to share it doesn't mean to uh smash or dominate or convert or convince our process of doing that is is very um peaceful it's from the heart it's not even intellectual the intellectual is a side of it but the essence of it is a heart to heart exchange and that's the development of a relationship and that that could be a relationship we develop with the chokidar and every day we see the chokidar and we say hari krishna and we give him some prasad and that person over a number of years you see him all of a sudden he's at the temple <laughs> it's just a relationship develops it's personal if we go to a temple and someone is unkind to us we won't go to the temple again we'll we'll miss our opportunity to develop our love for krishna but if we go to the temple and someone op- open heartedly says hello welcome to this temple oh you've come to see krishna krishna is wonderful come with me and you take them by the hand and bring them up they'll be so overwhelmed with gratitude um that they'll see krishna 
we we've opened their eyes to that love sense of our movement and it and it, it can only happen if we have a relationship with krishna it can only happen if our heart is open and it has to be open to others and we have to take that risk of relationship because relationship is always a risk and we start by practicing it with the, among devotees opening up to devotees and devotees opening up to us and learning how to have intimacy and confidentiality in our relationships this is what rupa goswami recommends to us mm. we 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 give we give gifts we share prasadam we share our confidential thoughts so you start doing that among devotees and then you 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 are then strong enough to be able to do it among anyone because we realize ultimately that everybody ultimately is a devotee and even if they don't say it don't want to think about it but that's our that's our spiritual perspective everyone is connected with krishna i i remember walking out of a temple in south india one time and uh, uh it was such a lovely experience in the temple that i was just overwhelmed and i walked out and and i bumped into someone and turned around and went you know oh no no stay no stay and it was a cow <laughs> really I, i remember feeling yes why not I'm I'm sorry for bumping into you, Mrs. Cow. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, this is a person, and this person has a relationship with Krishna, and they're just in a cow body. Fair enough. Krishna likes cows, but Krishna likes everyone. That Lord Ramachandra, you know, he came down as an avatar, but who were the people he interacted with most at the critical time? It was uh, monkeys and bears and and vultures and squirrels and you know. it was all of nature as as an avatar he was coming down to accept the service from everybody and he wasn't speciesist he didn't see the world like that and that's our example we also can't be speciesist like that he 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 accepted everyone's service and we have to have the same open heartedness but we have to know what a relationship is to have that open heartedness okay so you know i is uh, there are a lot of thoughts which i could reflect but let me try to take it in one particular direction that um, sometimes these podcasts they go in uh, in the, the in the discussions so many spontaneous points come up which i feel are worth exploring then we may not necessarily stick to the original plan so what you are saying is uh, that there's an individual relationship with krishna and there's a subjective experience of krishna and to the extent we have our individual relationship with krishna authentic to that extent we will actually be able to uh, authentically share krishna with others also otherwise yeah. if it is if we don't have a indi- personal experience or individual relationship then it will become more like a more like imposition that in this is the truth and this is what you have to accept yes so and and in in one sense um it's not either or it's both and so if if where we're at is we don't have a we don't have a developed relationship with krishna but we have some knowledge of krishna someone's told us about krishna and we're very fired up then we'll want to share it well don't stop that so run out there and share it and grab someone by the lapel and say have you heard about krishna krishna is great krishna is fantastic come and come to the temple and and you'll see for yourself uh, um there was a friend of mine he was an alcoholic and he used to come to the temple in dublin many years ago and he'd be on off alcoholic uh well alcoholic means on all the time but he would be drinking not drinking trying to trying to chant and be a devotee and then he'd fall off the wagon so um and he used to like to go out and do book distribution when he was in good consciousness when he was in good consciousness he'd come to the temple he'd rise at 2:30 in the morning and he'd chant all his rounds before mangal arti and you know he was really pakka and then he then he started drinking again so he was on uh, o'connell bridge in dublin one day and this guy came along and he was at the end of his cycle so he was distributing books but he was drunk <laughs> so this guy oh. came along and he said to him he said take this book take the book 
take the book. Look, don't look at me. Don't look at me. I'm worthless. I, I'm a drunk. But this book will change your life. This book will help you. This book. And he just, and the person took the book and was so touched with his honesty and his humility that he read the book and he became a devotee. <laughs> oh. So, So it's just, bhakti means the sincerity. It's not about the material circumstance. It's just a sincerity. So wherever we're at, however disqualified we are, or discordant we are, we should make an effort to reach out to others, to reach out to ourselves by doing so, uh, to advance ourselves. But we, we need to understand that the goal is to develop our relationship with Krishna. And as we develop that relationship, we have so much more to offer. We just need to understand that. No matter where we start, we should we should do something with our, the little enthusiasm we get initially. That's Krishna, and that 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 confidence that this is a good thing. That's the essence of faith, and that faith gradually, as we develop our relationship, develops into trust, and that trust develops into love. And that's a just the gradual development of any relationship. Where it's it's not it's not rocket science. It's common sense. So the same way we develop any relationship, we develop our relationship with Krishna. We do it consciously, we do it conscientiously, we do it devotionally, we do it consistently. So that every day we have an opportunity to start again, like the the Brahmins in the Vedas when they do their Vedic Yajna, and every day they recreate the Yoga Pit. They don't, they don't use the same one. They recreate it because they're recreating the universe. That's, the, that's what's happening. And they're recreating the universe every day, and everything starts again. And we have an opportunity to do the same in our spirituality, in our relationship with Krishna. So yesterday, we might have got it right or wrong. Who knows? <laughs> Generally, we got it wrong. <laughs> let's, let's, let's bargain for that. But we have an opportunity to start again and make little incremental improvements. And every day we can succeed a little bit, just a little bit. It's not a failure that we failed 90% of the day. It's a success that we made 10% improvement because that's not lost. The next day starts with the 10% in your bank account. So, so we have a great opportunity to develop our relationship with Krishna, but we have to take it seriously. We have to understand that it's serious. And therefore, our, the idea of relationship is very important to us. I can't come in front of the Lord and say, dear Lord, be merciful to me, and then go and kill a cow or a chicken or you know, eat meat or something like that and not be merciful to them. I can't go in front of the Lord and say, dear Lord, please help me come closer to you and let my ego fall away. And then criticize someone else's ego, some other person who's praying beside me, saying, oh, look at him, he thinks he's so great. <laughs> you know, we, we have to understand that this relationship, that re all these relationships are important. They're all related to Krishna. So I have to relate to them all with compassion. But I find my compassion, my love, in the little incremental development of my relationship with Krishna. And when I have that experience, then I have something to share. And I'm I'm waiting for the day. Mm, beautiful. So actually, we have covered a lot of territory in one sense. What you talk, we started about inside and outsider. So now, to to some extent, if we want to develop our individual relationship with Krishna, and as you said, it's it's a incremental process. That that example you gave of. So in one sense, authenticity is more important than purity. You said that somebody might be alcoholic who is drinking, not drinking, able to give up, not able to give up. But they are authentically sharing at that level. So this will help you where you are. That authenticity yes. is transform is more, in one sense, touches hearts much more than, uh, of course, purity is important. But even if we don't have purity, if we have authenticity, then that can also touch people's hearts. Well, I think that's the only thing that touches people's hearts. I think when let's let's look at it another way that the authenticity is the purity. The the other is is maybe cleanliness, shall we say. But the authenticity is the actual purity. Prabhupada says in a 
purport and nectar of devotion, he says, the only qualification is sincerity. And sincerity, the word is a Latin word. It means without duplicity. Mm. So that's the purity. When, when it's real, the relationship is real. And we may be pure in that we bathe every day and we chant mantras every day and that purifies us and we don't eat meat and we don't eat onions and garlic and mushrooms and all that and, and alcohol. So we may be keeping ourselves pure materially, um, physically and mentally and emotionally, but that doesn't mean pure spiritually. So let's. Uh, it may be that we look at purity in a different way. The purity for me is that it's without duplicity. It's actually pure. It's the essence of relationship. What's the essence of relationship? What's that pure focus when it's only Krishna? Oh. And the difficulty I have is that I have so many other options than Krishna. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like when I went into an exam as a kid, I was, you know, brought up in a religious environment. So you pray to God, please, please, please help me get the exam. And then you get the results and the results are good. And it's, I did so well. And I'm so good. <laughs> so it wasn't about God at all. <laughs> you know, no. whereas if I didn't get the exam, I certainly blame God. But he didn't get the credit. I took the credit. So we, we have so many other options than God. But how do we uh, focus on God? And God is the cause of all causes. God is the essence of our life. He's the one we love more than anyone else. And and I love myself more than God, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so how do we develop those, those practices? That's sadhana. And if we understand who we are in relation to God, how, how difficult it is to develop a relationship, we will certainly have great compassion on anyone who is having difficulty in this world in developing those relationships. We see someone who's rejecting God, and many people I see rejecting God, it's such an emotional rejection. You know, they don't want a patriarch telling them what to do. They don't believe in a, someone who's just going to crush them and crush their creativity. And you hear all these arguments. Uh, I don't believe in anyone who would allow young children to suffer, uh, uh, et cetera. And, and they're all good arguments, but they're a little bit sentimental and, and emotional. And they're rejecting God from that. It's not... It's, it's not very profound. They don't have a relationship with God. That's quite clear. So, so when I see someone like that, I see that there's pain in their heart. They're actually pained. I understand why they're rejecting because they have pain in their heart. They're trying to enjoy in this world, separate from God and separate from everybody else practically, and try to be become... Uh, get as much profit and adoration and distinction as possible. And there's a lot of competition for that. And they're in competition all the time. Now, that's very difficult to maintain that energy of competition. That's, that's suffering. It really is. Trying to become the most beautiful person in the world. Again, there's tons of Every woman in the world is trying to do that. And quite a few men. <laughs> I'm at an age where I'm out of the race. <laughs> And, and trying to become the most intelligent person. Again, a lot of competition. But ultimately, God fulfills all these roles. There is no competition. <laughs> there never was. So when, when you see, when, you, when I see myself and I see others trying to fulfill desires in this world that are really not going to make us happy, you realize what a suffering condition we're in. And even the idea, I want to be happy, only betrays the fact that I'm not happy. It's an aspiration. I wish it would happen sometime. So how, how do we develop? And, and we all look for it ultimately in relationships, relationships of love. And, and that's the gift that Prabhupada and our Acharyas have given. And I see it echoed in other religions as well. It's, it's, this isn't, it's not exclusive to our tradition. You know, that they, they say that love of God is the point. That it's the Christianity I was brought up with. I had heard all that before I joined Krishna consciousness. Coming to Krishna consciousness, I found somewhere where they practiced it. That was what I was missing. Who practiced this? And then all of a sudden, I was opened up to this wealth of liter literature about love of God that I never knew existed. Mm. The, all the bhakti traditions, incredible literature, absolutely incredible. 
So it it it's, it helped me ironically become the Christian I wanted to be. <laughs> So, so, but you never consciously felt that you were actually rejecting Christianity. Yeah. No, I never did. So no. it is okay. I, I was, yeah, and and again, that's the insider outsider thing. Mm-hmm. Why should I reject uh, the teachings of Jesus? Jesus's teachings helped me, uh, qualified me to um, understand why I should develop a relationship with Krishna. How could I reject my guru? In that sense, this person helped me. Uh, different priests who taught me also helped me. Um, my father helped me. He wasn't a devotee. He died when I was 15 before I became a devotee. He didn't know anything about any of this. So how how could I not give gratitude to all these people that Krishna sent to help me develop my consciousness, develop my perspective? How could we do that? That's very ungrateful, very thoughtless, actually, uh, la- lacking in generosity of any kind. So, so that that's what relationship means. Understanding that all these relationships are, there, all these people are, were sent by Krishna to help me, and then appreciate them for who they were, and and what part they played in our lives. Uh, so, it's the insider outsider thing is very difficult for me. It's it seems like a a false dilemma. It's it's creating uh, partisanship party politics, sectarianism. It's not very helpful. It's not, not helpful in spiritual life. And I don't think it's helpful materially either. I understand why people do it, because if, we're, if we don't have very strong faith, then it's very important that we, we make very strong declarations of faith. It's very important that we say, this is the only way. This is the only way you can see the world. This is the only way you can practice. This is the only truth. And that's all a bit bogus, because who am I to say what's the only truth? You know, Krishna is the only truth. Krishna, by his will, because Krishna can do whatever he wants, he can come down and uh, or just look at some atheist guy who never practiced any spiritual life and eats meat all day, every day and drinks alcohol all day, every day, and he can just take them back to Godhead like that, if he wants. That's not part of my religion, but Krishna is not religious. Obvious, because he's a, he's a butter thief, isn't he? Not very religious. <laughs> so Krishna can do what, whatever he wants. I have to allow that fact. So Krishna is the arbiter of truth, not me, not any religion, not any institution, Krishna. That's the essence of Krishna consciousness. Krishna is God, and that's what it means to be God. So Prabhupada started a movement based on the teachings of Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami and Jiva Goswami, based on the the inspiration of Lord Chaitanya. And yes, I'm, I'm with that. That's the revelation that opened things up for me and allowed me to practice. And that's how I gained access to Krishna in Vrindavan. Not even Krishna in Dwarka. Krishna in Vrindavan. That's the Krishna for me. That little blue boy. So I'm 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 focused on him. And I realize that a lot of people don't get that. And that's that's fine by me. But I can help them appreciate different aspects of Krishna so that gradually they can come closer at their own pace in their own time by Krishna's will. So whatever I can do to help, I'm here. You know, that's, I'm, I'm Krishna's servant in that regards. But I, I can't say that there is only one way because it doesn't make sense in our tradition, philosophically or theologically. It, it doesn't make any sense. Our Goswamis worked very closely with members of other traditions, borrowed from other traditions, uh, to advance Krishna consciousness. And and we all need to work together in this world, this God-forsaken world. Prabhupada said in the light of the Bhagavad in the 1950s, when he wrote that book, he said the, the leaders of the world religions should come together to, to help the world. And it, it's really to contribute to the common good. We should be able to do that, as well as be exclusive in our relation to Krishna but it's also exclusive to me and Krishna. That relationship is an exclusive relationship. 
And I should be able to share the joy that I feel in that relationship and the fulfillment that it gives, the satisfaction it gives to my heart. But I know that I can't replicate it in another person's heart. They have to do that for themselves. And, and that's what Krishna says at the end of the Gita. He says uh, to Arjuna, now deliberate on this fully and then do what you wish to do. Krishna's teaching method in the Gita is quite extraordinary. It's not dogmatic. It's not doctrinaire. He doesn't say that, Arjuna, this is what you have to do. This is the only way. I sometimes, uh, I've met some Muslim and Christian friends who have said, you know, in the Gita, Krishna says, you know, he says something, he says, this is my opinion, and this is my opinion. He keeps on saying that, but he's God. Why doesn't he just tell him what to do? <laughs> uh, but he doesn't tell him what to do because Krishna wants Arjuna to choose him because he wants him, to choose love because he wants love, because the Gita is about love. And that requires free choice. And, and Krishna establishes that absolutely wonderfully. So he says, I, I quoted it earlier on, that text where we're all spiritual individuals. So that's, that's the first text of teaching in the Gita. And Krishna establishes that we're all individuals. Therefore, we all have choice. So he established that first. The philosophy behind love of God is that, Vedanta. So first, we're all individuals eternally. So and that means we have the freedom, absolute freedom, to choose love of Krishna or not. And Krishna keep, maintains that for Arjuna. He doesn't take that away in any, any way at all. It, it means when Krishna says, never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, he says, you were never born. Therefore, I didn't create you. All the Indian philosophies, all the Indian theologies say that. That's a Christian and a, a Jewish Abrahamic concept that God created us. The material aspects of us are all created and we're beholden and we should give thanks to God for all that. But our essence, our, our, very, our very being was not created by God. It's eternal. So Krishna says, you, you, Arjuna, have absolute freedom to choose. And then it's interesting at the end of the Gita, after hearing lots of yoga and philosophy and theology and even material arguments where Krishna says, if you don't fight, people will laugh at you. You know, after Krishna gave him all the options, material and spiritual. And then in the end says, now do what you want. And Arjuna chooses to fight because of his relationship with Krishna, because of his love for Krishna, not because of religion, not because of theology, because he's, he, he liked Krishna. He loved Krishna. And that, that's the teaching of the Gita. And that's not dogmatic. And that's, that's, that Krishna didn't say, this is the only way, it's the only thing you can do. He said quite the opposite. He said, okay. Arjuna, you can, you can fight because if you don't, people will laugh at you. That's a terrible reason. <laughs> it's completely <laughs> egotistical. Yeah. But he gave him the option because it is an option. Krishna was totally open and honest with him. Okay. And, and, and that's how we should preach. If we I, want think to this preach. Is, this is, I think you've addressed the question which I was having. You know, I really appreciate how you are showing the, uh, at one sense, if there is, you are focusing on the individuality dimension of Krishna consciousness, and then simultaneously you're also highlighting the universality of Krishna consciousness. Sometimes the individual and universal uh, can sometimes be in contradiction, but the way you are explaining it, it, it is because we are individuals, that's, and because our philosophy acknowledges centrally that we're individuals, that is what makes us a universal. So, yes. because we understand that every person is an individual. Earlier, you talked about going beyond speciesism. So, yes. we acknowledge not just every human being, but every living being is an individual. Yes. So, yes. so, just now when we say that there are many parts, but you also made this point that, so that's a Christian conception. That is not a, that, the, that we are created. So, sometimes when we try to be universalist, then there is the danger of uh, sliding into uh, an uncritical relativism or just accepting that everything is right. So there, there still has to be some understanding that uh, while we have to be broad-minded, but that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as right or wrong. Like earlier you talked about atheists, their reasons for being uh, for rejecting God is are quite strongly emotional. So mm -hmm. we 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 do say that their concept, their rejection of God, 
that in rejecting god that doesn't mean god doesn't exist but we acknowledge their uh, the we acknowledge the reality of their their individual experiences which have led to their rejection of god and if we offer them more positive experiences and more personal relations rather than simply hammering theology then that will that can even transform them yes i it was my experience with my father in law who um i i i liked and admired very much uh, he was an atheist and and in the beginning of our relationship we used argue about god and spirituality so much i never log i never get anywhere it was a, a a ridiculous conversation um but over time he was an educationalist he used work for the world bank he he developed education programs in india and pakistan and in rwanda and all over the world and um uh, so i asked him to help in our iscon develop teacher training programs and different things and he he traveled to russia to america to europe to all over the place um to do seminars and workshops with devotees did it all for free and he really liked devotees he got to know tons of devotees anutma like you mentioned anutma mm. rajbihari sachinandan swami and so many people he met and 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 taught in fact um so he met all these people and really liked them he loved prasadam he loved to chant hari krishna he used chant hari krishna in the shower we'd all go on trips together in the car and we chant hari krishna to okay. you know um old english tunes and all, all kinds of stuff as as a game and he just liked it all so we stopped talking to him about god and he started chanting hari krishna he became a vegetarian he started serving the devotees he went to vrindavan uh he went to delhi to do some work for the government and he said to a friend he said my daughter is always talking about brindavan where's brindavan and he said look it's not far away let's go let's go tomorrow so they took a taxi went out to brindavan he got out of the taxi and right outside the door was braj bihari one of his former students who took him around brindavan and he had a lovely day in brindavan you know so i look at someone like that all the service they did from their heart and uh was it necessary to talk about god <laughs> was there a big point there you know the relationship that was developed when we stopped arguing became uh very profound and and when he died uh we got letters from all the senior devotees in iskon radnath swami and hrinanand maharaj and uh, you name it and they were all they were all sad to hear it and all praying for him so did he get the benefit of the association of the vaishnavas yes did he get the benefit of prasadam yes was he brought to vrindavan yes <laughs> everything all the things that we want to aspire for as devotees he experienced yet he called himself a, so he had this intellectual block or emotional block with the idea of god so just work around it why make an issue of it why why insist on chipping away at it and hurting him and hurting the relationship rather develop the relationship and take it from there and that that was just my personal experience in that one instance but i i think it's it's important more to focus on the relationship than the intellectual argument in many cases the intellectual argument is helpful i mean intellectually uh from an indian perspective uh in indian intellectual thought to say that there isn't a god to make a definitive statement there is no god has no intellectual uh, viability because you can't prove a negative you can't prove that there isn't a god so how could you intellect so the idea of god always remains on the table so a lot of the uh, non theistic not atheistic non theistic philosophical traditions in hinduism like non theistic uh, sankhya and uh, vaisheshika etc they don't talk about god but they don't reject the idea of god and even the uh, the buddha himself didn't say there wasn't a god he just refused to talk about god he refused to talk about all these things because intellectually it doesn't make sense to definitively say there isn't a god and then the atheist can say well but you have to prove that there is a god but if the basis of proof is 
is rational thought. If God is super rational, beyond rational thought, how could you use rational thought to prove something that's beyond it? That doesn't make sense either. So I, there's no onus on me to prove there is a God. I have my experience. That's it. That's all I need. So, so I understand intellectually, but sometimes there's no point even talking about it. It's better just to give someone prasadam and sit down and, and give them a hug. <laughs> it's more effective mm -hmm. uh, in helping them understand Krishna than having a big row with them. <laughs> that, that doesn't get us anywhere. So we have to use our, our intelligence and our, our emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned about your father-in-law. The Rasmandal Prabhu has also been on the podcast. And when we're talking about teaching and the whole paradigm about, about skills, values, those things, he said that he learned a lot from the courses that your father-in-law taught. Yeah. And he was also a person who strongly suggested that we invite you. So now, so if I understand right, what you are saying is that... Uh, uh, there is a role for rationality and that's why we have a tradition where books are written and there are polemical arguments also, but we don't have to reduce our outreach to rational arguments alone. And mm. sometimes we may outreach may require us to entirely bypass the polemical dimension entirely and just focus on developing a relationship. Uh, well, it's kind of yes and no. My, my whole career in Oxford, of course, is based on the academic and the rational. <laughs> yes, bro. Actually, I was going to come to that and maybe we could discuss yeah, that yeah. separately. So it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of like I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot here. No. Uh, but, but, but the fact is, you know, truthfully, the essence is bhakti in our relationship with Krishna because that's purely non-sectarian and non-partisan. And it means anyone can do it. Any child can do it. So we don't, if we have the capacity for intellectual academic pursuit, then yes, we should pursue it. Like our Goswamis, you know, they were very intellectual. They, they knew many languages who so were very intelligent, very well educated. Um, uh, Rupa Goswami used the, um, uh, the Rasa theory of Bharat from the 11th century, uh, to which was a, a, a literary a system of literary criticism of, of literary development. He used that to explain God, was a very strange use of, of this theory. So he, he elevated it to something else. So the fact that he was so well educated that he understood this theory, he understood poetics and drama and how it had developed in India over many hundreds of years, that's a highly educated person. And then be able to use those systems to explain the philosophy, uh, the theology of Lord Chaitanya. That's quite incredible, quite quite genius, actually. Mm. So we need to do that, um, and that that's the reason why I got involved in in education. I, I had having worked in ISKCON for so long and worked in ISKCON communications in days when there were only three people doing it in the whole world. Uh, and you know, it meant, just a minute, sorry, sorry. I mean, I appreciate what the direction you are going in, but yeah. I felt that maybe the since we have gone in one direction now, the OCHS yeah, yeah. we could discuss maybe in a separate podcast. Because I would like to explore this relational dimension a little bit more. Yeah, I know certainly. that the rational dimension is very important, and we could discuss that also separately. But if if you are okay with it, I can we can focus on the relational dimension a little bit more right now. Is that certainly. okay? Okay, uh, certainly, yeah. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. Anything so, to be, anything to maintain my relationship with you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I think uh, so. So you that that our tradition has a uh, vibrant. Uh, you could say vibrant intellectual basis. There's no doubt for that. And Prabhupada also did talk about, you know, he would take sometimes the devil's advocate and he would have rational arguments. Many of his morning walks are like featuring that quite prominently. So, so that definitely is acknowledged. But the point I was making is that sometimes we reduce a person to simply their beliefs. And then we said that belief is wrong. Therefore, the only way I can interact with this person is to correct their, correct their wrong conceptions. Uh -huh. But instead of doing that, instead of reducing our interaction with the person to simply a rash argument or on rational basis, we can broaden our interactions. And as we interact with people, then we develop a relationship with them, which could involve various dimensions. And then yes. the rational aspect may be addressed appropriately. And sometimes it may not need to be addressed so much also. Yeah. So... Um, just, 
Yeah. No, I I, to- I totally agree. That's a very good point. It it goes back to what I said um, earlier, and you you had quoted it that something comes from more a, a Christian Abrahamic uh, kind of Jewish Islamic perspective, um, and also a Greek philosophical perspective. These things go together, and that's how Western intellectual thought has developed. It it accepts certain assumptions, and it's, it's interesting for me to observe how these assumptions are now kind of globally accepted through through um, film and music and, and novels and also through social media. So I, I for instance, I, I saw the you know senior people in India uh, they text you know someone significant passes away and they write RIP uh, in pace, rest in peace. Hmm. Well this is a, a Christian idea. That when you die, you, you're dead. You're finished. Rest in peace. You're in the ground. Over. But of course, from a Hindu point of view, the person who's died is a Hindu, and they're going to take birth again, possibly. So there's no peace involved in that. It's going to be a squealing little baby, you know, and and their body's going to be burned. So there's no resting in peace there. So we we kind of accept practices in our global context. We're accepting things a little uncritically. And I also, I, I think that that becomes the case when it comes to religious assumptions as well. So you use the word uh, belief, and we talk about the word belief. But of course, in Indian, in Indian context, in a Vaishnav context, um, belief has no significance at all. Belief is very poor, a uh, very poor measure of anything. I may believe there's an elephant behind me, but you can see that there isn't. My belief is kind of, doesn't matter one way or the other. Uh, it's mm. the Indian context is based on knowledge and further realized knowledge. So that's why knowledge is emphasized. It's not about belief. It's about knowledge. It means there is no elephant. Done. <laughs> you know, so it's not about belief. Knowledge is important. And what's also very important and maybe more important is sadhana. So how do you, how can you tell anything about a person if they're knowledgeable and what their knowledge is, and you can have a conversation and test that. But if you ask them what their sadhana is, you can tell an awful lot about a person, a lot more than asking them what their belief is. So even so, again, back into an Indian context, if if I if I'm in Gujarat and I talk to someone in Tamil Nadu about their belief, and they tell me in Gujarati that their guru is Akira Loka Shrasmalai Vishnu Swami, I don't know who they, <laughs> who they're talking about. And his his uh, philosophy is called Rasamalaya Nanda. You know, I don't know what that is. You know, maybe it's something to do with a Bengali suite. I don't know. So you know, it's it's so different. The the talk about belief doesn't mean anything. But if I say, "What's your sadhana?" and you tell me, you know, I rise at four in the morning. I I I. Uh, uh, do meditation for two hours, I chant japa, I, I say prayer, I'm a vegetarian, I, I serve other people. Well, I don't care what religion you call yourself. I know who you are. You know, you're, you're, you're an interesting person I should talk to. Now, I can go to a Cistercian Christian monk, and I, I know Cistercian Christian monks, and they get up at three o'clock in the morning, and they say prayer for two hours, and they're vegetarian, and they shave their heads, and they wear robes. So what's What's the intrinsic difference? And you can say, well, they're not bhaktas, but they are bhaktas because the prayer they say for two hours every day is not fruitive. It's actually just glorification. They know that you don't ask God for anything. You worship God, you praise God, you love God. So what's what's the what? so I know the quality of the person. Now, if someone says, you know, I'm a I'm a Vaishnav, I say, what do you do? Uh, you know, I get up at 12. I have a cigarette, have a beer, I watch some television, you know, at 10 o'clock in the evening, I'll, I'll go out and uh, uh, go clubbing and I'll go to bed at four o'clock in the morning when the other guy is getting up. I also know that person. They may call themselves what they want. It's, their belief is not relevant. Their sadhana is relevant. Their practice, that tells me their character. That tells me an awful lot about them. Mm. So and then so so then who do I relate to? Yeah, who do I call a devotee? When when they say that we should have a relationship with Krishna, with the devotees of Krishna, with the, the innocent people, and we should ignore the demoniac. But but who are the devotees? 
Are the devotees the ones who are the people with the best sadhana? And where are they to be found? And I might find them in the Nimbarka tradition. I might find them in some Gaudiyamat. I might find them in the Pushti Mark. Uh, I might find them in the Sri Vaishnavas. I might find some of them in, as, as uh, Shaiva Bhaktas. <laughs> might find some Christians who I find inspiring. They may not know about Krishna in Vrindavan, so they can't give me that inspiration. But they can inspire me to think more deeply about my relationship with God. So, for instance, the Christian example I gave of the monk. So there was a monk, uh, Brother Owen de Bratton, an Irish monk that I knew. He was, in a, he was an old man when I knew him, a uh, well-known scholar. Um, and he practiced like that. And we used to have lovely conversations. And I, I, he, was, he was an old man. I was a very young man. And he was very encouraging to me, always very kind and compassionate and open-minded. And he encouraged me in my spiritual life. And it, it challenged me to see if he's doing all these things. And, and I was a brahmacharya at the time. I was doing all the same things, getting up early in the morning, chanting for two hours, vegetarian, all, all the same in terms of sadhana. So my challenge was what's special about my tradition? What's, what's, the, what's the different thing? I had to look much more deeply into my tradition to see, well, why am I practicing this then? And, and I found something. I found Krishna in Vrindavan. This idea of Vrindavan Krishna, this is unique. No one has an idea of God like this. This, this, was, this was, and this, so his association helped me tremendously. And, and I'm, I'm ever thankful to him even though he's, you know, Christian, and he's misguided, and he's the wrong religion, and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't, I didn't experience that. And I, 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 there were other monks that I, I wouldn't have spent five minutes with. <laughs> Just they had nothing to offer me. But this was, this was a rare soul. And where do we find these people all over the place? Was he a devotee? Without doubt, he was a devotee of God. But without doubt. I, I, what was his relationship with God exactly? I have no idea. I have no qualification to understand that. But but he he inspired me. He enthused me. He challenged me. He helped me understand my relationship with God. And that goes back to the story we started with. You told the story about my friend who came and had the experience, the challenging. Never okay, mind. Just I mean, or do you want to complete this thought? Then I I have yeah. lot to. Yeah, please go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. You, you. Okay, so, so, you know, the idea that our practice matters more than simply what we believe or we claim to believe or even what we think we believe, that is something which is very significant. Uh, I, in one sense, I was thinking that when in the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna talks about the gray zone between the black and the white. The black and white in the 16th chapter, the divine and demoniac natures. But then he asks the question, what about those who don't follow scripture? but they have some kind of faith. And when in answering that question, Krishna entirely focuses on behavioral characteristics. Now, mm -hmm. what they eat, what kind of austerities they do, what kind of sacrifices they give. It's broadly how they are functioning in the world. So Krishna is really not talking so much about um, what intellectual conception of the ultimate reality a particular person has. He's talking about how they are functioning in the world. So that's just to echo the point which you yeah. mentioned. So, yeah, so this no, to totally, totally. When you see a good person, like my father-in-law, the atheist, but he was a very good person. He was very moral, very honest. Um, he was a much, ironically, he was a much more religious person than I, I ever was. <laughs> you know, he, he took these things very seriously. I, I was always a bit flippant about things. But I, I had great admiration for him, for his principles. He declared his principles, and he followed them very strictly. It's very inspiring to see people like that. And the fact that he's an atheist is kind of beside the point. <laughs> you know, it's not a big issue. I didn't associate with him on that level. I was, wasn't influenced uh, by his atheism in any way. But, you know, but when you find someone who practices well, and uh, you have to respect them. And, and that goes the other way. When they see a devotee 
who is also very principled, then they will respect them. And that becomes the basis of our interaction in society because we live in mm -hmm. society. We are individuals. We can be universalists. And then the next part of it is how do we integrate in the world? So we, we have to integrate and we have to, to bring our principles with us and not compromise our principles. And that doesn't mean that everyone else has to practice our principles. That just means we have to practice them. The, um, the uh, psychiatrist Adler, I think in 1946, he said, uh, it's easier to fight for our principles than to practice them. So we'll get all up and, you know, these principles are the most important principles in the world. Everyone should, everyone should practice these principles. It's easier to say all that and do all that and be aggressive and get out there and, and color everyone than actually practice them seriously. Hmm. And then the other thing is Groucho Marx. I don't know if he was a, an American um, comedian in the last century. He said, I got principles. And if you don't like them, I got other ones. And there's, <laughs> okay. Who is that school? His name is Groucho Marx. Groucho Marx, okay. You know, a well-known comedian, a funny guy. Okay. Uh, but I, I remember I heard that. Very funny, uh, very witty. But but it's it's witty because it's so opposite to the reality. And But the fact is that sometimes we're like that. Sometimes we have principles and we got other ones. <laughs> They're not really principles at all. So we do have to okay. consciously understand what our principles are so that we can declare them in society. When we meet other people, it, they may be individual to us, but when we meet other people to identify ourselves, we need to be able to tell them what our principles are. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then once we've done that, we have to be seen to practice them or, or at least to be making an honest attempt, at least to try. And, and like my friend on the bridge who was drunk, he was trying but failing. But ironically, that was the convincing point. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so we have to try, at least, and be seen to try. That is but, but we do have to first identify what our principles are. And as I said, I've identified two principles for myself. <laughs> and they lead to other things and other practices without doubt. Mm -hmm. So the, the four regulative principles we talk about in this corner, they're very important for, as I say again, keeping us off the streets. Prabhupada says, by following those principles, you distinguish yourself from animals. Uh, so we've, we've decided to be human beings by following it. So I'm talking about more foundational principles, maybe. Mm -hmm. The so concept I, of the... Yeah. Sorry? As, no, sorry, if I understand right, what you're saying is that, that there are... Let, you earlier talked about that I have... Principles and I have other principles. Sometimes we see this even in, like, sometimes devotees may also unconsciously do that, that based on convenience, say for this purpose, I'll quote this principle. And for that purpose, I'll quote that principle. Yeah. And we can all quote from, if, you know, if we just learn enough scripture, we can at any time quote a scripture verse to support whatever we want to do also. Yeah. So then that, that, that can also be problematic. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. But that, that means that, that we become untrustworthy. Hmm. That, that's what it means. So it, if someone is acting like that, I can't take them seriously about anything. So this, this Machiavellian idea, this idea that the end justifies the means, that we can, we can use anything and manipulate it any way at any time. It, again, uh, the word I've used consistently in this, discussion is bogus <laughs> it's really bogus it's it's uh it's self-defeating it doesn't it has nothing to do with integrity it has nothing to do with sincerity uh non-duplicity it is essentially duplicitous so it means the end justifies the means whatever 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 to make it krishna conscious whatever that someone becomes a devotee whatever that i can make some money whatever and it, if if there are no principles behind it, then you're untrustworthy. And that's, that's a, an absolute disaster for a spiritual organization or for a spiritual person. Disaster, huh? It's a strong word. Yeah. Oh, it's a disaster. Absolutely. If, if, we, if we 
chop and change principles like that for convenience, um, it means that we haven't thought about the subject seriously. And we're misrepresenting our acharyas very um, profoundly. And we're misrepresenting uh, Krishna very profoundly. And, and you know, the, the funny thing, of course, is that Krishna himself is a rascal. He, he tells lies. You know, he tells his mother he didn't eat the clay, but it's all around his mouth. <laughs> you know, he, he, uh, he stole, the, stole the, the, the butter and gave it away to the monkeys. He's a terrible rascal. So we, we worship a rascal, but that, that doesn't mean that we be rascals. We're not Krishna. Krishna is there in the picture. We see the pictures of Krishna eating, eating the butter with a little smile on his face, looking at us. And uh, part of the smile I thought sometimes is because he's saying, I can do this. I can get away with this. And you can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's a little bit laughing at us. You know, we're a little envious, actually, that Krishna can get away with it. <laughs> so, but, but we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't try that. We should we should be um, respectable uh, in such a way that people will take what we say seriously, consistent. We should be so consistent in our principles that when when a, a Hare Krishna devotee speaks, then people listen, and that's how you have influence even on executive decision making in society without getting involved in politics, without trying to lobby. We shouldn't be involved in any form of lobbying, any form of political or partisan politics. We should act in such a way that people come to us and they want to have a relationship with us because they trust us, because there's so few people you can trust in the world. And you, when you find someone, then you go there, you trust them, and then you'll listen to anything they have to say because it's it's all going to be well considered and well thought and it's coming from a, a good source it's coming from the heart and it means that you're taking them and their needs into into uh, consideration and that considerate approach very very rare in the world very difficult to find somewhere like that and our all our temples all our devotees should be repositories of such relationship and that that would transform the world that would give people real hope that there is love and there is real peace to be had in the world. If we just use the mechanics of society, if we get involved in the social mores, the kind of relationships that people, uh, that politics and economics dictate and advocate, uh, then what's, what's different? <laughs> what are we offering that's different? We can say we're offering knowledge, but knowledge knowledge isn't it. We have to we have to offer example. We have to be acharyas. Mm -hmm. Lord Chaitanya was quite quite clear about that. that uh, one of the principal preaching instructions: achar over prachar. Precept is easy; anyone can read a sheet, but there has to be an impact. It has to hit the heart at some stage. That, that's our challenge. And it's a, it's a very profound personal challenge. It's not an institutional challenge. The institution is only made up of people. It's a very profound personal challenge. Mm. So overall, this is what you are saying, if I understand right, is that it's uh, the key thing over here is that we learn to that the real connection, the real transformation for both us and for others is when we start manifesting, uh, when our devotion leads to manifestation of virtues and integrity. And that, that way we develop authentic relationship with others. So now, mm -hmm. if we go back to the one of the earlier points that you mentioned about, uh, you said that uh, there were some some monks from the Christian tradition from whom you could learn a lot and others you, you would not have felt similarly that you could learn much from them. And the difference you said that is based primarily on uh, recognizing how they are living. What they, and that, that is what makes a key difference. So isn't there some level that, uh, that beliefs are 
I know the word belief is not so much there in our tradition, broadly speaking, but still, the uh, there is sadhya and there is sadhan. So in some ways, you are talking a lot about sadhan. And what are the means we are using? That what are the what things that we are practicing, and which is of course important. But sadhya itself is not unimportant. Sadhya or how we are living or uh, sorry, what is our conception of ultimate reality? That also has its has its importance. We can't just oh, ab- absolutely and and so and that's our faith. And in our tradition, every single person on the planet is a person of faith, because we all have faith that I'll uh, when I get up this morning, I'm going to be happy. The possibility is there. Otherwise, why would we get up? The the scientist is getting up, saying, "I have faith today that my experiment will go well. I have faith that by this process, I'll do something good for the world." Uh, everyone, everyone is a person of faith. We, we're all, we're all projecting into something, and we all have a relationship with some process that we take seriously. So, so in that wide context, that universal understanding that everyone, uh, shraddha means where we put our heart, and there's so many words in Sanskrit for faith, and they all have different meanings. But shraddha is say a very basic one. But where we put our heart, we all put our heart somewhere. We all put our faith into something. So I'm going to associate with people who have faith in God. And, and I'll find them. When I go to a Christian monastery, I'll, I'll find someone there. And some others, they, their faith isn't very developed. Now, the only reason why I can't learn from them is my ego, uh, because I, I categorize them and, and put them into a box, you know. So it's another form of... of uh, of kind of uh, just ego, basically. But but there's also people in the ISKCON temple that I'm going to do the same with, because the way their faith is developed is not enthusing me in any way. And and their idea of faith, and this is the idea of uh, Kanishta Madhyam Uttam in our tradition, the stages of development of faith. It's a very, very interesting paradigm. You can put it on any tradition, uh, it's not only it doesn't only work just for Vaishnavas. You put it on any tradition. It's it's very interesting way of looking at things. But we have people who have weak faith, people who have strong faith, and people who live in love. It's just even beyond the idea of faith. It's gone somewhere else. So we have to uh, to be effective preachers. We have to get to the Madhyam stage. We have to go beyond the the Kanishta stage. The the just a stage where we don't know very much, but we're willing to run around and hit people over the head with a book and say, read, 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 you know, take, take, take. And then they hit us over the head because that's their stage as well, in their religion. And uh, they shout shout at the megaphone at us and, and all that. Uh, and that's all very good and that's that's helpful. But to be really effective, you have to be at this Madhyam stage. And I met such people of other religions. that They were people of real faith in God, very very strong faith in God. They weren't people that I had to convert in any way. They were people who were already converted. They already understood God, had a relationship with God, talked about love of God, had dedicated their lives to God, and had practiced for longer than I had practiced. So like this brother Owen that I mentioned and others, Kenneth Cracknell, a Methodist priest that I knew, um, they helped me in wonderful ways to open up my vision and understand uh, in a much more humble and honest way what my relationship with God could be and challenged me uh, very, very uh, mildly, but very firmly to go deeper into my own spirituality, to define myself to myself so that I could understand my own spirituality. So wherever I find, or wherever any of us find someone who can help us, that's why why should we reject that? These people are sent by Krishna to help us. And they're sent from all, all kinds of places. Um, am I going to take initiation there? No, I've already taken initiation. <laughs> That's done. Decision is made. Mm. And, and if they say something that uh, challenges me, then I go to Prabhupada and I read and I meditate and I take as long as it takes for it to come out. I go to the Sangha of Devotees and discuss it with them so that I get a perspective on it. But I've never found a situation where I've had a challenge that hasn't been met by Prabhupada, hasn't been met by the principles that I've adopted. And I've never 
been shaken in the idea that the best concept of God I've come across is Krishna, without doubt. There's just no other idea of God that is so loving, so kind, so merciful, so universal, so attractive. I like Krishna. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> so in one sense, you could say you are, to some extent, your experience is echoing what Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about, that how when he goes to a place of worship of some other religious tradition, at one level, he says that, uh, that we appreciate that the Lord is so compassionate that he is manifested in this particular way to attract these people. And seeing the compassionate nature of the Lord, my attraction to the Lord in the form that I know, in the manifestation that I know is increasing. Yes, so, so exactly. Be... exactly. Yes. So I, I, was, I was at the Parthasarati temple in Chennai some years ago. And uh, as I arrived at the temple in the evening, a procession was coming out. And it was very jolly. Uh, all these Brahmins chanting in front, chanting behind. And there, were, there was a deity on a procession cart uh, being held up. And uh, I had no idea who the deity was. I couldn't recognize anything. I couldn't recognize anything of any of the chanting. And these were Vaishnavas and I was Vaishnavas, but it could have been a completely different religion. <laughs> just I had no idea what was going on. Yet we're all Vaishnavas. And I just, in that mood of being Vaishnavas, I followed the procession. I smiled at the Brahmins. The Brahmins smiled at me. The people were making offerings. I was smiling at them. They were smiling at me. We were all there to worship God together. They could have been Christians, Muslims. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. But, I, but it's just we were caught up in this idea that we're there to worship God. I didn't know why they were there. Some people were there offering puja to ask for a BMW. Some people were asking for love of God. I didn't know. It was so many different religions on the street that day. Maybe all calling themselves Sri Vaishnavas, but so many different religions. Now, which one do I choose to associate with? Who do I get to talk to? Who do I? And I'm interested to talk to the one who talks to me about love of God. Otherwise, there's, why, 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 why stop and talk? If I talk to one of those Sri Vaishnavas who's looking for a BMW or talk to a, a Muslim gentleman who's looking for a BMW, what's the difference? That's the same religion. That's quite striking. Huh? So uh, now just to go back to this point that sometimes so uh, we, need, we need to recognize that certain people's faith or conceptions may not be in agreement with what Mm -hmm. uh, with our understanding. And if that is, uh, that is unhealthy for us, we can keep a distance from it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we have, to, uh, we have to demonize them or we have to reject them. Mm. But then of we course, also have... Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, shouldn't, we shouldn't be unkind to anyone. There's no, there's, we, and, and not only not being unkind to people, but it's very detrimental to promote our faith by, by trying to uh, uh, demonize, as you say, or trod on, or you know, rise ourselves up by trotting on the back of someone else. That's a terrible thing to do. That's very, that's cruel. That's himsa. That's absolutely wrong. Then there's no need for it. You know, either your faith stands because of its brightness, because of its beauty, because of its truth, or it doesn't. You don't have to beat someone else up. Because they, because they're making the same claims, you know we're right. No, we're right. No, we're right. No, Krishna's right. I'm not right. <laughs> You're not right. We're just guys. We're just guys on the street trying to help other people. But I can't say I'm right, or my tradition is right. I don't know. I I just have this wonderful experience, and Krishna's right. And and that's something that we can say with a heart and a half. And the other thing we say is because our faith is weak. When our, when our faith is weak, then we have to insist that this institution is right, this way of looking at the world is right, this guru is right, and it's, it's all right, and you have to accept the whole package. Otherwise, your ears are going to fall off and your eyes are going to curl up, and uh, horrible, horrible things will happen if you don't do exactly as I say. We, our faith is weak, so we have to insist that other people think the same way. But everyone thinks differently. Everyone feels differently. That's, that's the constitutional nature. That's the idea of the individual. So 
Why do I accept this guru? Why do I accept Prabhupada? Because of his integrity, because of his spirituality. It's it's there for everyone to see. Am I willing to share that with people? Absolutely. You know, he's he's my inspiration in everything that I've done. He's the person I want to see with a smile on his face at the end of it all. So do I do I have a guru? Absolutely. Who doesn't have a teacher? How can you not have a teacher? That's that's very arrogant to go through life and say that I didn't need a teacher. <laughs> Ridiculous. We're all dependent on, we all read books and get inspiration from other people. And, you know, is there an idea of God crystal clear? For me, Krishna and Vrindavan, no, no difficulty. And I'll share that with anyone and everyone. But, but I won't insist that my way is the only way because my way is my way. And then I'll insist that the other person consider, consider your way. Take Krishna into account when you have that consideration, but consider making Krishna your way. So I'm not interested in someone joining the Hare Krishna movement, and then we have a, a numbers game at the end of every year, X number of members, blah, blah, blah. It, it's really about someone gradually develops their relationship with Krishna, and they take the time it takes to develop that relationship in a mature way, so that once they get involved with Krishna, it's forever. They, they don't have to bounce back and forward. And however long it takes, it takes. That's that's between them and Krishna. They have to ultimately convert themselves. They have to accept Krishna into their heart. Like in any relationship. You know, I can say, love Jane. Your first question is, who's Jane? <laughs> what does she look like? I mean, can you love Jane? You have to, you have to figure out. Can you love Jane? Some people may not be attracted to Krishna. They may be attracted to Lord Ramchandra or Jesus Christ or something else or Lord Buddha. And, and that's that's fine, absolutely fine. But they they have to develop their attraction to someone. They have to have an Ishtadev. That will help them in their life, without doubt. But Murari Gupta said to Lord Chaitanya, he cried. And he said to Lord Chaitanya, I, I, you're always talking to me about Radha Krishna, but I love Lord Ramchandra. And Lord Chaitanya said, well, that's okay. <laughs> don't, don't worry. <laughs> and that wasn't the first instance. That wasn't the only instance of that. So we have to allow other people to have their Ishtadev. Uh, but we can still encourage them. We can still encourage their heart. And even if their Ishtadev is Lord Shiva and Durga, and whatever, it doesn't matter. But if they in their life have a devotee, who's a devotee of Krishna, and they have some affection for that devotee, Krishna takes that as affection for himself. So there's there's no loss. We have to understand the bigger picture. We're not the, uh, we're not the answer to the world's Ill, ills. We're just servants of Krishna doing whatever bit we can do. But what we can do, if we do it well, is very substantial. That's striking. At one level, this level of transcendental subjectivity, where, as you said, is worship somebody's worshiping Lord Ram, and we appreciate that. But if somebody says that, you know, I adore the impersonal Brahman, and that's what I want to attain, then there is a certain level of uh, we could again differentiate between Brahmavadis and Mayavadis, and. Uh, but isn't there are there, aren't there some conceptions that are that are clearly wrong and they need to be they need to be challenged and countered or even that will depend on the particular context and the nature of the relationship with that person and then it, we decide. It, yeah it does I, I have many friends who are brahmavadis and mayavadis but i find that they're brahmavadis on tuesdays and mayavadis on thursdays they don't know what they they don't know what they think and they're back to us on Sunday. <laughs> okay. You know, they kind of they, they drift around from one to the other. And if I pick on one and make an issue of it, then their ego demands that they have to take it seriously. Whereas before they didn't take it seriously. So if I just ignore it and let it slide. Now, if someone comes out in public and makes a declaration that Mayavad is the only way to understand, and Mayavad is the understanding of the Vedas and all that kind of stuff. But that, that's a public forum, and in that public forum, in that mood of public discourse, which should be gentlemanly, 
It should be done with respect. Then I, I can stand up and say, actually, I think there are other ways that we can interpret the same text. And I can challenge them. And I should challenge them. And I should challenge them robustly. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, Irish people, we like to be robust. <laughs> Prabhupada, <laughs> the only thing Prabhupada said about the Irish is they're always fighting. <laughs> so so I can, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fight anyone on that level. But on that level, not in a personal relationship, I shouldn't take it into the family. I shouldn't go to their family home and start a fight at the dinner table. I should be respectful of them. And this is their understanding. But my relationship with them, I, I've sat down and had kirtan with many Mayavadis. And they sit down and they chant Hare Krishna and, and Jai Sri Ram and, and whatever. Uh, Govinda Jaya Jaya. They have no problem with that because it's all one. So why not? <laughs> so so what's the loss? I don't on a personal level, a one-to-one -one level, I don't have to challenge anyone. This is their personal understanding, their personal attraction. Fair enough. They, they don't see it in other, but a lot of them really do appreciate bhakti when they find it. When they find someone who is able to share heart to heart. So I try and put them in the way of such people, of such kirtan, of such bhajan. And uh, they get very, very attached. I send them, I send them copies of different devotees singing, and they say, "Oh, I particularly like this one. I'm playing it in my car all the time." So we have a, we have a good relationship, and it doesn't have to be about me smashing the demon, and uh, pulling out the mayavadi out of them, and all that kind of stuff. It's, you know, it's it's not relevant to my relationship with them. If they stand up in public and challenge me, I'm I'm there. I'll meet the challenge on behalf of Prabhupada and Krishna. If if no one else is going to do it, I'll stand up. <laughs> no problem. And do my little bit for the cause. But um, but we don't have to make an issue about it otherwise, I don't think. Most people go through life and they don't think about religion from one end of the week to the next. It's not a big issue. And and we can make it an issue by forcing them yeah. into a corner. And making an e an ego issue. Once you make it an ego issue, you've magnified it out of proportion, and it just becomes ridiculous. Yeah, that's so striking. What you said that that Brahmavadi is on Wednesday and Mayavadi is on Thursday. That when people join a particular group, it is rarely because of the philosophical beliefs, philosophical propositions, or the co. It is it is not solely because of the philosophy. It is because yeah. of many other reasons. Yeah, it might yeah, be yeah. culture, it might be heritage, it might be that their own lineage or whatever, so many other reasons, a sense of belonging. Yeah. And uh, when we, a, as you said, when you pick on them for that particular thing, that's when it becomes big for them. Yeah. That's, that's very striking. Yeah. And if you avoid that, then there are so many people we can work with and we have many shared causes that we can work on. Yes, we have to give them the facility to convert themselves. Beautiful. Convert themselves. Yes. Yeah. That's a nice way I, of putting it. Well, I, I, that's, I'm directly quoting Prabhupada. Oh, in, exactly. a letter, in a letter to Jayapataka Swami, he, he says that, that people convert themselves. That's, that's how spiritual life works. Oh. We, don't, we don't convert anyone. We just introduce them to Krishna, and they develop their relationship with Krishna. And that's, that's, they make the choice to serve Krishna, to know Krishna, to love Krishna. They make all the choices. Oh. All, all, all we do is make the introduction. If we, if we want to be the converter, it means essentially we want to be Krishna. We're standing in the way. Look at me, look at me. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll show you. This is the way. But, but we just have to introduce them to Krishna and introduce them to our understanding of Krishna you know, our, our appreciation of Krishna, our um, faith in Krishna, our trust in Krishna, our confidence in Krishna, and they'll they'll become enthusiastic about that. Oh. If we, and we do that by introducing them to the Sangha of devotees, to Kirtan, to Prasadam, to Murti Seva, uh, to the holy place, which is the temple, which is our home, maybe. We've made it into a holy place. So by, by just by introducing them to these things, they have the experience themselves. They, they'll have a wonderful experience. They'll come to the community of devotees and they'll understand this. These are lovely people. 
Um, and when they have that experience, they, they convert themselves. That's amazing. So in one sense, we are not denying the role of that. In one sense, we are, if you are talking about, we are a preaching mission and we have to, we have to, it is our mandate, we could say, to, uh, to share Krishna consciousness with others. But mm. the may, way in which we do it can be can vary radically. Where... Oh, yes. Yes. We're, we're redefining preaching and conversion, these concepts, very radically. The, these, these ideas have kind of uh, Protestant Christian uh, connotations. When, when we think of them, we think of them in those ways. And early devotees thought of them in those ways and practiced them in those ways. But we have to, as we grow as a society, we have to redefine these terms according to Vaishnav principles, Gaudiya Vaishnav understanding. And when we do, then it becomes wonderful. That's why we need temples. That's why we need the Murti Seva. That's why we need the community of devotees. That's why we need the Kirtan. And there's all kinds of facilities and management and uh, finance that we need to create this facility for devotees. So that's that's all there. That's all part of the mission. But the the spirit behind it is the most important thing. It's it's quite profound, and it is a radical redefinition of these terms, uh, very much on our own terms. And, and in a sense, you know, you you often hear people saying. Um, uh, Hindus don't don't preach, don't convert. Uh, but Hindus have always done that. Hindus have always shared knowledge. That's been the basis of everything in Hinduism, sharing knowledge. People coming and teaching gurus and mats and temples and having the spiritual experience. We've always done that. And people have always transformed. There's so many stories of, of uh, Valmiki becoming a, being a hunter and then becoming a great devotee. There's all these stories of transformation. This is what the whole tradition has always been about. But, mm. but the, it's, it's how it happens is interesting. Everyone makes it, they're, they're confronted with the circumstance, and then they make a decision and a choice. It's very personal and very individual. And it's very, it's really, <coughs> really tailored for their circumstance. Krishna arranges it like that. And it's very interesting when you ask any devotee, how did you join? It's always a, a wonderful conversation to have. It's, it's uh, and, and the two questions that are most meaningful for me spiritually with devotees is how did you join and why do you stay? They're why the most, do you stay? Okay, that's, a, that's most, not that common a question, you know? I don't know how many. That's a very profound question. And, it's, and that's, what, that's when you see the person's spirituality. Because we, we go through so many tests. And, and ISKCON, like any institution, like any community of people, is complex. Uh, it's one reason why I always thought impersonalism is so attractive. Because you don't have to deal with people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dealing with people is just so difficult. But when you realize that complexity and you meet people who are supposed to be pure and not pure and, and all these complexities, then why do you stay? Why do you stay in, in such an institution with such a mission? And that, that I always find very enlightening and very heartening. It's, it's always very interesting. But everyone's story is so individual. It's, it's tailor-made. Krishna just made the suit for them. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I really probably we could have in back to I'm one of the editors of Back to Godhead. So we have often articles on how I came to Krishna consciousness. I don't think what makes me stay in Krishna consciousness is an often discussed topic. Uh -huh. But it, it if we discuss it, it really gets us. Because we all have had reasons to leave. Uh, and right now, also at each moment, we can come up with so many reasons yeah. for leaving. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a very, it's not a back to Godhead question. It's a very intimate conversation. It, it needs to be very frank and honest. You, you, you need to have a real relationship with someone to be able to ask the question and for the person to be able to uh, honest, answer honestly, because you have to admit to so many faults in the institution and faults in our practice and our understanding. 
So it, that's not it's not so easy to encourage people to do. Uh, and it's like you know the propaganda element is join ESCON, chant and be happy. But you know yeah. I meet people who are really not very happy at all, and they're still chanting. <laughs> that's true. It's almost like. You know, we say there are these romantic movies. We show all the struggles, and then they live happily ever after. Yeah. So and, the and happily ever after is not really a happily ever after. So we we in our movement have a is we have, could have a devotional version of. You went through all these challenges, struggles, and then you came to Iskon, and then we lived happily ever after. Yeah. So after that, also, it's not that we are not happier. Definitely, we can say we have a greater meaning, greater purpose in our life, greater joy in our life. But still, there are challenges also. No, and... we, we still we still stub our toe. Uh, our parents still die. Um, you know, all the challenges that anyone has in life, we have. The only question is, how do we respond? You know, with the, I was talking to a devotee yesterday, a friend of mine, and uh, he lost his mother. Uh, the mother's in her was in her nineties. You know, so you'd expect her to die sometime, of course. Mm -hmm. But still, this it, it struck this devotee very, very hard because grief is grief, whether you're a devotee or not a devotee. Now, how do you deal with it? That that's that's what uh, that's what our challenge is always. So, so the why why do you stay thing, in spite of the fact that the propaganda value is important. It's important to get the message out there, but but the practice is very individual and it's a practice of a lifetime maybe more than one lifetime <laughs> but it's 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 we have to we're in for the long long term and we have to understand that things don't change overnight if we don't change overnight we we, we all look for the the quick fix but that's not what spiritual life is about it, it can happen like that but it's not the usual thing so do we understand what spiritual life is are we willing to to give up our ego, give up our material desires. And I struggle with them every day. Everything we've talked about, you know, is wonderful conceptually, but the practice is, you know, you have to do it every day. <laughs> it, you know, if, if, if I want to be a good athlete, I have to do it every day for hours and hours and hours. We have to make that commitment. And that, that's what our Krishna consciousness is. And and we need there need to be resources. We need to develop resources inside us to help us go on with that. That's our spiritual life. Mm. And there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, I've I've transformed as a person since I I joined. I've I've become a person I never thought I could become. And I'm so far away from being anything perfect or sadhu like or anything like that. But I'm just so much more than I was. I'm inside. There's this inner satisfaction that I'm definitely on the right path for me. Like I can't convince everybody else to be on my path because it's for me. In my relationship with Krishna, I'm so happy I have one. I'm so happy because it's transformed me so much. And I pray that I can, you know, give something back to Krishna and and show my gratitude and in some way, however that that can manifest, by the grace of the devotees, by the grace of uh, all, all my well-wishers, including my, my departed parents and all these people who gave me so much, they gave me blessings that got me here. I'm so grateful to all of them. And Srila Prabhupada, obviously, for the sacrifices he's made, for my guru, for the Sangha of devotees, Everyone who's and just developing that sense of gratitude has mm -hmm. changed me as a person. You know, I spent most of my life being ungrateful, unthoughtful, not, not even realizing who I should be grateful to or why I should be grateful. And it's, it makes such a difference to understand how many people have given me blessings to get where I am. I, I really am a, a very much a work in progress. We all are. <laughs> And if we're honest with ourselves, then we can, we can you know, so much. That, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. That, that the fact that we are works in progress, that is something which I don't think any devotee will deny. Uh, but at the same time, the acknowledging that 
I am a work in progress and I am having flaws and translating it into action in terms of being, say, respectful and tolerant towards others, especially those from other traditions or those with differing belief systems or practices. That is something which doesn't happen. The way you are, because you've spoken in this context, we talk about Trunadapi Suni Chena, that's our the foundational teaching of Lord Chaitanya. But uh, often when we are interacting with people of other faiths or people with conceptions that we consider wrong, that humility hardly ever comes out. It mm-hmm. what comes out as more as a self-righteousness or uh, presumptuousness. Uh, that may be intentional, that may not be intentional. Mm. But, but in one sense, extending the ambit of our humility to not just... Uh, so, so we can also say that because I am flawed, it's, it could be that my conception of the ultimate reality may not also be perfect. And mm. the way I am presenting that ultimate reality to the other person may also not be perfect. And that's why I needn't approach with a, such a certain, such a sense of what is this certainty of my own rightness. Yes. So that's I, it's somehow that is not thought about so much humility in that direction. And mm. uh, one of the things that I, it struck me after I, for, for, uh, I'll maybe we'll just wind up with this. And what you spoke today echoed with so many things which I have experienced. The initially in the first few years of my spiritual life, I thought preaching meant giving classes and answering questions, which is, which is important. But over a period of time, I started realizing that I learn a lot about what to speak and how to speak by hearing from my audiences. That, okay, you know, this is what they're understanding. This is where they're coming from. And I, I needed to do it, because, especially when I started traveling outside India. Um, but, uh, but before that also, uh, I was, I had a lot of sense of this, but once I started traveling outside India, I realized that even devotees are so, so almost incredibly or inconceivably diverse in where they are coming from, how they think they are mm. all, they are Krishna conscious and they are following the two cardinal things which you said about Krishna and Prabhupada, but still they are incredibly diverse. And if I am to actually interact with them properly, I have to broaden my conceptions of Krishna consciousness. And that comes by, by having that attitude of hearing and le- hearing and learning, even from those to whom, which may we, whom we are, we may have the service of teaching them, mm. but even then from them also, we have to hear and learn. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah. So to generally at the end of the podcast, I try to summarize what we had discussed. So if you have a few minutes, I can do that. Or if you would like to add some concluding words right now, you could add that and then I can summarize. How would you like to go? Concluding words like Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay. Let me let me summarize that. Maybe you'll be able to get so so today we I think the broad topic we discussed on was you know the centrality of uh, uh, of developing relationships and sharing Krishna consciousness. Not only sharing, but also relation Krishna consciousness. He started with the point of insider and outsider, but he mentioned that how you could say that that is a very artificial differentiation because even within ISKCON, different centers, different gurus, different devotees have very different, significantly different ways of practicing Krishna consciousness. So the ultimate insider would be the individual itself. And so, so if we are to connect with others, that is just because we live in the world. So we are interacting with people from different uh, different backgrounds, different persuasions, and different devotees also. So we have to understand others' perspective. So in that sense, we could say everybody, even our devotees, is an outsider for us because we have our individual experience of Krishna and other devotees have their individual experience of Krishna. The different devotees in different temples may have relationship with their particular deities. So from that perspective, you discussed, you also talked about your father-in-law, how he was an atheist, but now you appreciate him as a person and there was no, without preaching, just by interaction with devotees, he started appreciating devotees. And so the idea is that when we are share, when we are connecting with people, our purpose is not so much to convert anyone. Everybody, every tradition will claim that we know the truth and we have the truth. But the point is, it is how we live the truth 
that is going to transform attract and truly transform others and that is actually going to transform us also so authenticity in one sense is the ultimate purity that some if we are at our level and we speak according to what has worked for us and we share that then that is that is what will attract others uh, and uh, with respect to other religious traditions how you now depending on what a person is practicing we can learn from others so the practice the what a person is practicing defines them far more than what somebody is believing now this doesn't mean that you explain how from the bhagavad gita's perspective you know krishna gives multiple levels of reasons for following for say for arjuna to engage in war but there is a higher there is a hierarchy of reasons and the higher the reason the better uh, say krishna uh, but, but the point overall is that krishna is not saying this is the way and others are going to go to hell don't follow the way so krishna's approach is very inclusive now this doesn't mean that we become sentimental and say all paths are right but it is rather we try to look at the right in whatever path a person is following instead of simply rejecting their path is wrong because their their beliefs or their intellectual conceptions are opposite from ours are different from ours we see what is good in theirs and we connect with them at that level and he said you know even for people from other other conceptions like a person whom we may who might be dismissed as a mayavadi may actually not be a mayavadi it's only when we approach at the level of the ego and try to think that we are going to correct their their conception then they make their philosophy then their philosophical conceptions become a bigger matter then they what actually are so by focusing on the commonality uh, commonalities we can we can actually help them to come toward krishna and it's not that we convert anyone but rather we provide others the facilities to convert themselves and what is you know if we see authentic practice committed authentic practice in other traditions then what is unique about our tradition that, that is the krishna conception of god and that personal relationship which we can have with such a attractive conception of divinity and that is our distinctive contribution and if somebody is in a public forum speaking in a contrary conception contradictory conception then we can we can challenge uh, we can challenge them but that can be done in a that can be done in a dignified way not in a not in a attacking the person but in a objectively presenting the philosophy or present making our points and toward the end you mentioned about how when we are sharing bhakti so preaching itself needs to be redefined it is to the extent i am insecure in my beliefs to that extent i will have to impose i am right and you are wrong and to the extent i can prove that i can get you to agree with me that bolsters my beliefs but if i have authentic relationship with krishna then i have experience of krishna and that is the basis of my belief or my my shraddha we could say and then i can approach you based on what you need and then i can uh, we can find out how best that person can be assisted in their journey so you our humility and our acknowledging the faults is not just something in prayers to the lord but it's also in our conduct with all living beings by which we can we can see how we can be of service to them so the doctor with kanishtha madhyam uttama and uttama means we madhyama means we do make distinctions but those distinctions are more from how we can serve how we can connect they are not from a just position of uh, of placing ourselves in a holier than thou attitude so that way when we reconceptualize actually our preaching then we can truly benefit the world so anything you would like to add prabhu no oh, very nice very thank you thank you very much for this is uh it's been an amazing podcast and i look forward to having a future discussions again with you sometime soon by krishna's grace thank you chitanya prabhu thank you very much hari thank krishna thank you very much hari krishna